everyone to our loss prevention welcome back session. Um, what you need to know to begin a new academic year. My name is Dominic Green. I'm the Director of Health and Safety Initiatives for Delta Epsilon, Oregon Class 99. Um, and we are excited to be here today. Um, I'm joined by two of my wonderful colleagues. I'll let them introduce their, themselves real quick. Nicole. Hi, everyone. My name is Nicole Bolinsky Leopard, and I serve the fraternity as the Director of Chapter Development and Conduct. I've been on staff for the past a little over three years um, and worked directly with the loss prevention policy as it pertains to chapter accountability um, and conduct incident and other related matters. Welcome everyone. My name is Carl Grindle and I serve Delta Upson as the Associate Executive Director. Uh, primary responsibility is managing the day-to-day -day operations of the fraternity and at this time of year, uh, tend to spend some time in the area of loss prevention and excited to spend uh, the Friday with you. Don't. Perfect. Well, here's us. Um, if some of you I know I've met directly and or exchanged emails with, but we appreciate you being on the call. Um, so today's session, we have a lot of packed in to just one hour. We are going to cover um, some updates to our loss prevention policy. There has been some changes. We're also gonna talk about incident reporting and our Good Samaritan policy, if you're not aware of those. We're gonna can go into best practices around event planning and judicial procedures. We're gonna give a couple quick updates on substance-free housing, um, discuss COVID protocols as we're going into the fall, um, as we started the fall. For some of you, some of you on the quarter system have not started yet. And then we're gonna talk about um, changes to our changes and updates to our insurance program. So a lot to pack in an hour, but we're, um, we're gonna do it real quick. Um, like I said, if you have questions, um, feel free to use the question and answer box that's on there. Um, we'll try to get to your questions. Um, if we don't have time to get to your questions, we'll make sure we'll follow up with you after the fact, but feel free to put your questions in. We might not stop right away, but feel free to drop those in the question and answer box. We're, not, we're really just gonna use the chat box to, to send you links for things. So please use the question and answer box if you have any questions or um, anything that we might've skipped or something we might've missed. So, all right, we're gonna move forward and I will turn it over to Nicole. Awesome. So this is a general overview of the components of our newly updated loss prevention policy. So we're going to briefly go over each component, but I want to draw your attention to the components that are starred. And then I'll highlight briefly why we made either updates, changes, or additions to those components of the loss prevention policy. So uh, within the changes, we updated the language uh, within our hazing policy, as well as updated the language within the discrimination, harassment, and sexual misconduct policy. And we either added or revised the language to make a different component of our policy within the areas of assault and battery, retaliation, and firearms, explosives, and incendiary devices. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time reviewing a component that might not be new and has not been updated, at least not within the past couple of years. However, uh, it is the component that we receive the most questions on. And when we do see um, any kind of violation of our policies or questions about our policies, it is typically around the topic of alcohol and drugs and what the fraternity permits or does not permit within this area. So I just wanna highlight here um, that we do allow uh, social activities for our chapters. They are able to be social. They are able to host events with alcohol. We just have placed some limits to um, those events and what alcohol use can look like for those that are of age um, and are appropriate to consume. So I wanna highlight the alcoholic beverages. If they're served, they must be served at a third party venue or a B, through a BYOB system outside of the house unless a chapter does have that substance free housing waiver. In addition to that, if a chapter is planning a social event with alcohol, we do prohibit those common sources of alcohol that it might look like a keg or party punch, something like that. We don't want our chapter members or the chapter to be funding that alcohol purchase within our BYOB policy. And that does mean bring your own beer, hard seltzer or wine. Um, and we want members that are of age to be bringing their own alcohol to these uh, proved and appropriate events. Also when planning an event, uh, we wanna ensure that our chapters aren't co-hosting or co-sponsoring these events with any kind of event promoter or alcohol distributor. Um, we do wanna ensure that our chapters are also uh, collecting a guest list for these events. This is uh, 
important for a few different reasons, but we want to see our chapters taking note of who is attending events. Um, and we do not permit uh, or want to promote the, the um, uh, rapid consumption of alcohol. And so we do prohibit those drinking games. Beyond that, I um, wanted to spend a moment looking at our hazing policy as this has been updated to reflect um, the uh, recent updates to the Louisiana and Pennsylvania law. So you'll see this mirror both of those states' laws. We've seen that uh, those have, laws have been explicit and detail-oriented. And so I want to highlight that our hazing policy um, prohibits any kind of uh, brutality of physical nature, mental nature, emotional nature, and any other activity that may create any negative effects to someone's health and safety holistically. So this has been newly revised. We could go back just one slide. Um, additionally, we edited our discrimination, harassment, and sexual misconduct policy. Um, we updated this to be a little bit more explicit in that each chapter must follow the uh, state, local, federal laws as it pertains to sexual misconduct. Um, and we're encompassing those laws within our policy reflected per the state. Um, so this includes but not limited to the definitions around consent, sexual violence, sexual harassment, domestic violence, dating violence, stalking, and sexual exploitation. Next, we have a, a, a little, we revised um, our physical assault policy to now be assault and battery, which prohibits fighting and physical altercations with the exception of any kind of self-defense and also defines what assault and battery might look like as it pertains to the state the chapter is located. Next, we have a new policy um, encompasses retaliation. So we prohibit any kind of retaliation to any member or chap member or non-member um, or chapter for reporting or inquiring or cooperating with a report around a violation of our loss prevention policy. We want our members in the community to feel at ease in reporting any kind of incident. And so we've established this policy to enforce that. Uh, hopefully a greater level of comfort in reporting of any kind of loss prevention incident or health and safety incident. Next, we revised um, our fire health and safety uh, to take out and be more explicit around the firearms, explosives, or incendiary devices. Um, this does include anything from guns to uh, fireworks. So we are prohibiting that regardless of state law at any kind of chapter event or at the chapter facility. And last but not least within our policy, there is there still remains the fire health and safety component. It just looks a little different um, and urges our chapters to follow all local fire codes, inspections and authorities recommendations and does include candles um, that should only be for use during formal ceremonies. Perfect. Thanks, Nicole. Um, just to let all the advisors know on the call that we can email you a copy of the um, that has what was changed from the previous policy. So we'll, we can send that out um, after this call. So we did drop in the current policy, but it, we wanted to let you know that we do have, if you're curious what language did change from the previous policy, we do have that available as well. So um, we can't send it as an attachment via the chat box. So, because you know, modern technology. So, I, we also didn't want to cover. So, Nicole, good segue. Um, obviously, with our some of our updated language to our loss prevention policy, we did want to just remind you about incident reporting. Um, so, our chapters have been pretty good about this this already this fall. But we want an opportunity to let you know we do have a section on our website for incident reporting. So, this could be from a minor minor injury you know someone might have had to go to the hospital because they slipped and fell and you know and maybe broke their break, broke their wrist or it could be something a little bit different um it could be something that someone was hospitalized at an event whatever that might look like so whether it be small or large um it's best we really want to emphasize it's best to let us know about this we are here to help you and especially help you your chapter um I help you as an advisor to really kind of get through a situation so if something minor happened you know, we will definitely follow up and just be like, hey, what happened? Um, this happened recently that we had an issue with a, um, something that happened in the off-campus uh, chapter house. Um, and it's, it's good to know we can walk through a situation. But if it's a little more serious situation, we want to make sure that we are taking care of our, our students. We are making sure that the person 
per person or people that were involved in the incident are taken care of? What kind of follow-up do we need to do? Do we need to do any kind of, we'll talk a little bit later about crisis management, but what other follow-up do we need to do? And in some cases, we might have to um, contact our, our insurance carrier um, if there is a, a larger scale incident that happens at either our chapter facility or at one of our chapter events. But we definitely just want to emphasize, we're here to help you. Um, and it's much easier for us to help you when we know about the situation right away. Um, as someone, I was a former chapter president, former chapter advisor, now work for headquarters. It's much easier to let us know. We've been telling, we, we shared the same information with the undergrads this summer at LI to make sure that when they are reporting that they let you know, the advisor, they let their chapter liaison know at headquarters, um, that they're letting the campus uh, administration know as well, just so we can be, be there to support you. So it, it could be something where we can help connect the chapter with local resources. It could be a counseling center or it could be something where we need to do some damage control really quickly. Whatever it is, it's much better for us to find out about it right away and do a quick follow-up as opposed to waiting and finding out about something two or three months later and then and then everyone being like, oh yeah, yeah we didn't think it come, anything would come of this. So please, as you're working with your chapters, let us know. Um, the incident report process is on our website, um, just the top bar. So just please, um, if we could help uh, reinforce this is a positive thing we wanna know so we can help the chapter. Um, because of that, when I would say positively, so if there is any kind of medical situation um, that in involves any kind of medical emergency, we do have our medical Good Samaritan policy for individuals and for chapters. So we mentioned before, so I've gotten many times as the chapter liaison, I've gotten a text or a call late at night um, and being like, hey, I'm going to send you an email. I also filled out the incident report process, but we want to, this policy is designed, especially after the Timothy Piazza death at Penn State um, in 2017 for Beta Theta Pi. Um, every national, international organization created and adopted a medical Good Samaritan policy. Most of your campuses should have one as well, but it's really there to protect individuals to never have them feel worried or afraid to call 911, right? So we want them to make sure that first and foremost, call 911, get that person medical attention. This could be a guest. This could be someone who stumbled in your chapter facility and just passes out on your, could be in the front front lawn. This could be something that passes out at a, at a party. We never want them to say, oh no, we are already in trouble. We don't want to call to get this person help. So this, the reason why we have an individual policy, that's really sometimes chapters worry that if someone is already on probation individually for at a local chapter, they're worried that if their roommate has to get hospitalized, that they're like, oh no, I'm going to get in trouble. My roommate's getting in trouble. Like that's not the case. This policy is involved for, it's really for medical um, med medical purposes, get that person medical attention. Don't just throw them in the back of a pickup truck and drive them to the hospital. Call 911, get that person proper medical attention, um, and then we will follow up. How this works is um, we will definitely follow up with the chapter. We'll definitely follow up with the members to make sure they're okay, but they're not going to be going through any kind of judicial procedure because we have this me medical good Samaritan policy. We want to make sure that people never hesitate to call 911. So if you have any questions about this, um, it's also embedded in the loss prevention policy as well, the full language for both the individual and chapter. But please as continue to remind your chapters as I've been on the road and continue to talk to chapters, this is something they always seem to be very interested in and knowing at least a little bit of, um, I would say, um, uh, rest assured that they know that we are there to, to support them if something happens. So we want them to report things. And then if it is a medical emergency, we want them to call 911. So let us know if you have any questions about that um, as we go forward. So also wanted to just cover this as well. Um, if there is some kind of crisis situation, so this could be something that the chapter was involved with, or it could be a campus situation. So chapter situation could be something where, um, where there was a hazing incident, that happened. It could be a sexual assault incident that happened specifically with your chapter at your institution. In other cases, this could also be a, a crisis situation that happened that's happening on campus. Um, you know, I worked on a previous campus before where um, someone at night spray painted the word rapist on every chapter house on campus. So spray painted outside, you know, all the chapter houses were owned by the university, but the, but our chapter, as well as all the other fraternities on campus kind of had the, oh no, what do we do moment, right? These are things that we can help. Um, obviously, um, if there's any kind of, of media follow-up, we'll work with the chapter. Um, we also want to make sure that we, they follow crisis can, can, a crisis management plan, that they know exactly who they need to call, who they, as we mentioned before, through the incident reporting process and Medical Good Samaritan, who, who the right people to call with, but also we can help you deal with the media. Sometimes it's talking points. Um, in, a, in a crisis situation, the only person who's, who's allowed to talk is our executive director for the fraternity but we want to make sure though that we best support you to how to handle a situation because the last thing we want is as we've seen on some campuses recently um, there's been protests outside of fraternity houses or there has been major 
major pressure from the school newspaper or major, you know, asking questions or people parked outside, like at, asking our fraternity members for help. Um, so this is not our help, but this has happened to other campuses, to other fraternities. We want to make sure that we are there to help you. Um, this is where we can really come in to come in, uh, be an assistance to your chapter, to your students. A lot of times people don't even think about this. Oh, this will never happen to us. But we want to make sure that this is where you can best support the advisors, the alumni, but also our students in a crisis situation. Um, I see that there is, I don't know if we want to, is it time to pause? I'm going to let Carl and Nicole, because um, I can't, is there any questions we want to? We do welcome questions. Uh, we just had a comment that the medical good Samaritan policy is a great idea. Okay, perfect. Okay. Appreciate that. Great. All right. So let us know if you have any questions more about that, but um, we do have a crisis management um, uh, plan that is in that was dropped in the chat box. So please make sure that you have an opportunity if you have not utilized that in the past, please, please, please um, make sure that you're taking a look at that, that you have a conversation with the chapter. Let's not wait till after an incident to be like, wait a minute, how do we handle this? How do we do this better? Let's make sure you are prepared to handle a small situation or a large situation and, and then how we can best help you in that process. Perfect. Um, and perfect. So um, what we're gonna do is talk a little bit about industry best, best practice practices, um, specifically about event planning and then judicial board procedures. Um, as we, the reason why we wanted to talk about event planning, we covered this um, this summer at Leadership Institute, all of your chapters went through a loss prevention program at LI. Um, and what we did was we wanted to talk specifically about, uh, about event planning, more so in the context too, of thinking about how are we planning to still be, especially since we took last year off, right? So with COVID and we did not plan events or host events, that a lot of our chapter current, as we all know, some of our current chapter officers have never seen what normal social events look like, right? But a lot of them are coming off of COVID and now the chapter facility, if you have a facility, is, is substance free, right? So how are we planning for that? How can we still be active? How can we still be social? What does it look like to still follow our policies? So just want to let you know, as, as, we, as, as we get into that, is how as an advisor, are you talking to your students about what does it look like to not only plan an event, both if you have a facility, great, or maybe, you know, they might have something, you know, at at, um, at local bars and restaurants in the area that they can rent out, or it might be something at a senior live out house, whatever that looks like. But we, what we did was we had a conversation with our students this summer about thinking about any type of event plan. So this could be planning a tailgate. This could be planning a, a homecoming or a Founders Day event. This could be planning a formal that's 40 miles away from campus or even a camping trip. We wanted them to think about any type of event, not just a social event. What is because for a lot of these students, they've never actually had to plan these things. So we have chapters that have social chairs, brotherhood chairs, chapter presidents that have never actually seen what it normally looked like, what their big chapter, you know, off-campus formal in Myrtle Beach looks like, right? They don't, they don't know what this looks like. So we walked through with our students. And specifically, we actually used a, an event planning app. So Holmes Murphy is our insurance provider. Um, there's actually, if you go into the app store, so whether you have a, a Droid or, um, or an iPhone, um, in, the, in the app store, it's called the HM Event Planner app. So it is literally a step-by-step -step guide that was put in an app form. You can also put an email address or um, after you fill out. So the students will spend, so we had the students at LI this summer go through step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step of anything you can possibly think of, of where you know, who needs to be involved, when they're going to do this event, where, you know, where are they going to do this, um, who's going to be involved, think about the policies involved, think about potential risks and liabilities, right? So, so thinking about the HM Event Planner app, the nice thing is that while you could, as an advisor, you could sit down with your social chair and loss prevention VP and, 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 and plan an event together, and also as an opportunity to then, you can put emails that this can be sent to you, right? So you can make sure that if you're not with them or you're with them, that they can CC you and send you a copy that basically comes out in a PDF form of the entire event planning guide. Um, we also have in the, the event planning guide is an opportunity. It's also, that's something that's on our website as well. So it's an opportunity. It's a very large document, kind of a kind of like a paper form. So those of you that are not necessarily into using an application form, there is a guide that steps that you name, they'll ask you about transportation. Like, how are you going to get there? How are you going to do food and beverage? You know, all the things you need to think about to, of creating the safest, most fun event, but we want to make sure it's important. Um, and also just kind of reinforcing to tell our students that this is a great way when they're starting to think about planning events. So let us know, but also as you're working with your students is making sure as they're planning any type of event, um, is thinking about what kind of loss prevention policies need to be thought about, 
or considered when planning an alumni tailgate versus, you know, something that is a brotherhood camping trip, or it could be a date party at the local bar down the street, right? Whatever that looks like. Um, and then making sure that they're, they're planning these things well enough time. So everyone's involved, everyone knows what's happening. Do you need to register with the university? All of those things you might need to do. But also one of the big things we, we walked through the summer was what are all the potential issues that could pop up, right? So if you're doing something with the women's rugby team, you know, what, what, what liability issues, what considerations you need to take to make sure that you're going to provide the safest um, event possible. So if you have any questions, let us know about that. But we definitely, um, it, whether you use the app or not, make sure you're having conversations with the students this summer, sorry, this fall, about event planning and not just events at the facility or, or, you know, or you know, at a bar down the street, any type of event that they might be planning. Perfect. I'll let, turn it back to Nicole. So something that I've spent uh, a significant portion of the last year working on, especially with our chapters that we have seen uh, incidents or allegations of our loss prevention policy is working with various chapters, judicial boards, and is ensuring that they have a sound practice in place um, to uh, lead accountability within their chapter. So I just want to talk you all through as advisors and pose some questions to you as it pertains to what the judicial board looks like within the chapter that you're currently working with. And I uh, want to first ask if uh, you know who the members of the chapter you're working with um, that are on the judicial board are. And then if you could say with confidence that chapter would know who the members of the judicial board are. Um, unfortunately, we have seen chapters where with the mess of COVID-19, they've lost that sense of who is our intent internal accountability measure and board and then we're going to, working really hard this fall to reinstitute the formality to that board and at their purpose within the chapter so i wanted to ask you if you knew who are the members on your chap the chapter you're working with judicial board um wanted to ask you the question if uh if you've attended a chapter meeting recently or you're reading the chapter minutes how visible would you say the chapter's judicial board is um, as an advisor, have you ever been invited to a judicial board meeting? Have you ever been sent the minutes of a judicial board meeting? Are you aware um, that the chapter is even taking minutes or recording what's happening at judicial board meetings? Um, and with that, want to make some recommendations. So uh, the start of every solid judicial board practice is to make sure that we're properly selecting, whether that be through election or appointment, and the proper judicial board members to serve on this internal accountability board. So selection can be defined by the chapter's bylaws, whether that means they're elected by the chapter body or they're appointed by the chapter president or another officer. But we do wanna make sure that all of our documentation, our governing documents are followed as we implement and select our judicial board members. The best practice for judicial boards is that it reflects one individual from each associate member class that we can evenly distribute uh, the age range um, and maybe a uh, very demographic of every associate member class within the, or within the judicial board. Uh, I also recommend that uh, if someone's elected or appointed to the judicial board, that they continue in that board until they either wish to resign or they graduate from the judicial board to ensure continuity um, and uh, ensure that there is that um, that uh, historical perspective that exists on the judicial board as they manage and hear allegations of loss prevention policy, chapter policy, university policy, or house rule violations. Um, with every judicial board that I'm working with and I facilitate a training with, I challenge them to write their own purpose statement. So every chapter will have a different lens that they view their internal accountability measures. And as long as we've established that every chapter needs that internal accountability, then they can put their own flair on what exactly the purpose statement of their judicial board should be. In the chat box, Carl has linked um, our judicial board guidelines document. Within there, you'll see our recommendation or an example of a judicial board purpose statement. I work with every chapter that I facilitated training with to write their own, personalize it as it pertains to their chapter and how they want to come off the group, whether that be they have an air of more so uh, mental health care and concern, or that they want to ensure that uh, their chapter reputation is intact within the community, whatever that may be, all through the lens of education, development, and building better men. So I want to encourage you all to challenge 
a judicial board within your chapter to establish that purpose statement and then to read it to the chapter so that the chapter understands why the judicial board exists and why it's important to chapter operations. Beyond that, I work with each chapter um, on incident reporting. So how a member of the chapter would report that they saw another member, a brother of theirs, potentially violating any kind of policy. Um, I've worked with chapters to uh, include uh, QR codes and chapter minutes or put a little QR code image within the chapter house so that there could be a reporting form attached. But uh, there's a lot of creative ways that we can um, promote incident reporting. But ultimately, we want to make sure that our chapter members are aware of how they would report an incident, how the executive board would report an incident, and what the streamlined process will be from that incident reporting point and how the judicial board will manage from there. So the judicial board is able to facilitate both informal and formal meetings. Formal meetings, meaning the entire judicial board is present. Perhaps there's a more severe policy um, violation that has been alleged. Um, and maybe even an advisor attends. And we know that there's going to be some sort of outcome from the conversation. There could also be more informal meetings where it's more of a check-in with the members, attitude, attendance, commitment to the chapter or just general well-being, and maybe it's not the entire judicial board that attends, but we wanna make sure that our judicial boards know that they can serve both purposes as an entity that checks in on the general care and well-being of chapter members, and also as that accountability arm for formal violations. And the judicial board is able to, do, to discern and distribute meeting outcomes within some limits. So they could provide either punitive, educational, or restorative sanctions um, as defined through the chapter's bylaws with the exception that the judicial board cannot make the decision to uh, suspend a member's membership or expel a member's membership. That decision does need to be made by the chapter um, and there are resources on our website and I'm happy to answer any questions about our suspension or expulsion process, but that cannot uh, be, that decision cannot be made by the judicial board. Last but not least, the Judicial Board has a responsibility to educate the chapter on loss prevention policies and to follow up with members that do attend Judicial Board meetings. That's how we uh, are committed to true brotherhood and accountability through the lens of brotherhood, um, is if we're following up and expressing care for our members beyond maybe a poor decision. Great. Uh, Nicole, you might have covered this, but um, are do we do our associate chapters have judicial boards? Our associate chapters should have judicial boards. Oh, sorry, perfect. So, um, if you have questions about that, um, feel free to follow up Nicole, and she can. Um, if your if your associate chapter does not have one or need to, needs help getting it started up, Nicole is your person. Great, thanks, Nicole. Um, all right, our next section. Uh, perfect. So, I wanted to just remind everyone um, it should not be um, it's not new news at all but um, substance free housing obviously um, full implementation started in August 2020 um, as we all know that we had a global you know obviously there was a shutdown or uh, by and and in like majority of our campuses obviously no um, events were happening um, on our campuses so for some of our chapters they did say that did help them with the transition because they went from having significant amount of events to just having absolutely nothing this past year right so as we talked about within a you know uh, about 10 minutes ago the event planning process when they went from having going 100 miles an hour to going zero mile, miles per hour and then now they can't have, have something at the facility this is where we really need assistance from the advisors to really think about how can we best be still be social how can we still have events um, how can we just not seize everything and, and still be active in our communities? Um, so um, uh, we just dropped the, there's a substance free housing page, resource page on, on, uh, on our website. So if you have not seen that, um, so whether you have a facility or you don't, um, we've been talking to a lot of our chapters, especially this summer, um, is thinking about what does it look like to, when you had maybe in the past, a very significantly large social budget, right? This was going towards just social events, parties, whatever that might look like, is switching some of that programming to brotherhood events, right? So 
how can we shift that budget that was going towards event rental spaces or having to, to, to pay for things at the facility, specifically around social events? How can we shift that to brotherhood events? How can we maximize both informal and formal brotherhood events at that facility? Maybe that means paying for more food at informal events, whatever that might look like. A lot of our chapters also started shifting to doing substance-free social events with sororities, right? So this could be um, pumpkin carving with the sorority. This could be, um, this could also mean shifting like a, an event that you normally have with XYZ sorority. Well, you know what? Now we're going to go bowling with that sorority off campus. So obviously you're going to have to shift some funds around, whatever that looks like. But we know that some chapters also, a chapter I worked with um, has brought a sorority over to do, um, they bring sororities over every two to three weeks to do like a PB and J social. So it's a social event, but they actually make about 500 peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and they have a partnership with the local homeless shelter and they so after the fraternity sorority makes all the events so it's a social thing you know they play music and have some food there they will drop off all the sandwiches so um at his homeless shelter right so this is an opportunity to still be social still use the facility still be able to do things at the house i think some of our chapters are struggling with how can we still do things and not realizing they can still be social without having alcohol there right as we mentioned before it's a dry facility um not a dry fraternity if you don't have a house um, these are just general good ideas for y'all to start thinking about too, is how can we make sure that we're doing more brotherhood programming? Uh, we had very large, well-attended sessions at LI for, um, for brotherhood event programming. So it was really important for you to follow up your chapters about some of those event ideas, because that's where we had some really good key ideas. Just want to let you know, we also do have some other peer organizations that, we're, that are currently also substance free. So Beta Theta Pi, Sigma Phi Epsilon, if you have a farmhouse chapter on your campus, um, Phi Delta Theta as well. Some of our Phi Gamma Delta Fiji chapters do have a waiver process. Um, so some of them are dry, some of them are not, but it kind of just depends on the actual um, on the actual chapter. So just let you know, speaking of waivers, um, so our waiver program did start two years ago. This is the second year, final year of the program. Um, we have nine of our currently housed chapters that are under the waiver program. So um, if you don't have a waiver, you don't know what the waiver is, don't worry about it. The waiver allows our chapters for two years to an extension and to give them a little bit more time to transition to full substance-free housing. So they're allowed to have a limited number of social events um, and they are allowed to um, have alcohol in their in, in their actual private private rooms. Um, I, will, I did want to let you know, though, that any chapter, regardless of um, whether you're substance-free or not, um, or you have a waiver or not, every chapter is allowed to have a, a alumni, you can register events with alcohol if you have a facility. So this is just at your actual chapter facility. So I'll do a little caveat. This is allowed for any chapter, but we have to make sure that the campus allows it, right? So some campuses, you, you have a facility on a dry campus. Well, if the campus doesn't allow it, we're, we're going to, whatever's the strictest rule, we're going to go with that. Also, sometimes the house corporation might decide like, yes, we're allowed to do this, but we don't want to have, um, we don't want to have um, uh, some kind of wine and cheese at our, at our homecoming event, right? Whatever that might look like, you're up to, you're allowed to have up to six alumni events per year. Um, so a lot of times chapters are using these for tailgates, right? Um, this could be also Founders Day events, homecoming events, whatever it might look like. It can be BYOB or a third-party vendor. Um, and there is a, reg a registration process on our website. So if you go on the Substance Free Housing web uh, website, scroll down, it says an alumni registration process. You just click on that. Um, if you're going to register the, your remaining four or five tailgates, you can just do it all in one form. So we've had a couple chapters that have done that already this semester. But this is allowed. So if you're thinking about wanting to do something, um, please make sure you register it. Um, and then contact me if you have any specific questions um, to walk you through what it could look like. Some chapters have also... Um, struck up a deal with a local catering company so you can have someone come in like a third party vendor and then and they can actually just they can deal with serving uh, beer or wine um, just let you know and any particular thing if you're doing something at a f at your facility hard liquor anything above 15 percent abv or 30 proof is not allowed at these events so it's really just beer or wine white claws um you know cider whatever it might look like so just let if you have any specific questions uh, there is an al also a guide on the Sums Free Housing page that does break down what is above 15% and what is below 15% ABV. So if you have any questions, but please let us know. But we just wanted to make sure, promote this more, that um, chapters with facilities are allowed to have events if you, if you choose to, right? Or if it's allowed. So perfect. And then finally, just some standard protocols for COVID. Um, we have had some recent issues pop up with some of our chapters and just on other campuses where um, even campuses where vaccines were mandated by the campus, that we are having some issues where um, we're still having some COVID outbreaks, right? So these are things. So just wanted to, as you work with your chapters, to please remind them to 
um, to, if they're having events, the limit capacity, do as many events as possible outside. Um, if, if the local guidelines talk about masking or, um, or if they're still calling for weekly or biweekly testing, make sure your students are taking part in that. Um, we're having issues specifically, um, you know, we don't want any outbreaks. We, we've had an outbreak already on uh, some campuses um, that, you know, that ever, you know, was 100% vaccine mandated. They're still having outbreaks on campus because they weren't doing testing. So I know every campus is different. Um, this is really just a reminder is being having students be really smart about things. We're seeing campuses that came in and started the school year um, with no limits on anything. And then a week or two later, they're saying, you know what, you can't have more than 25 people in a room together. So mind you, if you have a chapter facility that 30 or 40 people or 80 people live in, what does that look like for your local meetings? Does that mean your meetings have to go back to being Zoom? Can you do your meetings outside? What, are, what does that look like for you to make some um to make some accommodations at least right away to try to get some of this stuff under control. We, we don't want, you know, everyone's biggest fear factor is that, you know, that campus is going to get shut down or that people are going to get sent home again. Um, that's not what we want. I know that's not what you all want. We just wanted to remind you all that we're seeing some things pop up even on campuses where, or chapters that are like 100% vaccinated. So just think about that um, to make sure as you're, as you're talking through or walking through or anything. So, sir. Okay, perfect. Dominic, there was one question related to the prior topic about alumni events. Can yes. undergrads be charged for attending alumni events? The fee would include cost of alcohol, beer, and wine. Um, I mean, I guess in, in theory, yes, if they're 21. Um, I think that would that would that could cover something like this. Um, I do think that um, an alumni event, like I said, sometimes the alumni events, like I said, if so, we're talking alumni event at the facility. I, I, I mean, I think if it is something where it's a, you know, it's the, the ticket is, is being, ticketing system is being done by a third party vendor, or it's something that, you know, the food, um, if you're doing something like this, this would also, you're, when you're having events, there should also be food involved as well. I know sometimes you have homecoming events, right? Or Founders Day event where it's like a ticketed event, you know, it's $25 a person that might cover. But like I said, um, the, the fraternity shouldn't be paying for alcohol. Um, they should be, if, it, if, if, the, if the ticket goes towards food or the, the cost of renting a facility or some kind of third party thing, that's great. But the ticketing should not be covering the alcohol. Does that make sense? So it should still be a cash bar. They should, the undergrads, you should not be charging undergrads for alcohol um, and the alumni. Like I said, um, that's why sometimes a lot of alumni, when we first launched this alumni registration process, the, the thought of having to charge people or have a cash bar, whatever that looks like, which is why we allowed BYOB, as long as you're still following our BYOB guidelines and our loss prevention policy, we were going to allow that as long as it's monitored, that it's not just a free for all, that it's some, someone is there distributing and they're checking IDs, whatever that looks like. So if you have any specific questions, feel free to reach out to me, um, but make sure that, you know, that the undergrads can attend alumni events that there's alcohol present, but making sure that they are 21 and that the the ticket is not going towards alcohol, it's going towards the cost of, you know, other other related things. Carl, did I get that right? I just want to make sure. Okay. You did. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. I mean, to me, the piece is yes, undergraduates can attend. Um, and only those that are uh, of age to drink can drink And any drink that is consumed needs to be purchased. Um, at that time, you can't purchase by tickets or other allocation. Perfect. All right. And if you have any specific questions, uh, feel free to follow up with me after this. Our contact information will be on the last slide and we're done. Perfect. All right. I'm going to turn this over to Carl um, if you have um, to talk about insurance. Thanks, Dominic. So we're going to take the last few moments here before we get to questions to talk about the insurance program. Uh, on August 25th, uh, all chapter officers and advisors received the memo for the coming year related to the changes in the loss prevention assessment, the general liability insurance carrier, uh, as well as the invoices for this fall semester. Um, a few housekeeping items. Uh, the due dates remain the same for this year. So September 15th uh, is the primary due date or was the primary due date for uh, the loss prevention assessment to be paid. It's also the deadline for membership rosters and other fees to have been paid by. Um, there are a handful of chapters that do have an extension until October 1st. Um, so while that uh, date passed on Wednesday, um, we do normally look for the checks to be post postmarked as of September 15th. Um, but if there is a significant issue or challenge uh, your chapter may have in paying those fees, if they can contact me directly, uh, we'll do all that we can to find a reasonable um, solution for the chapter moving forward so they're not uh, penalized. 
Um, the billing split for the loss prevention assessment has been uh, changed back to the normal 75%, 25% that we have done in the past. Last year, we changed that to a 60% due in the fall, 40% due in the spring uh, as a direct result of the pandemic and to try and uh, address some of the um, cash flow issues chapters may have. Um, and so uh, those things really remain the same. Um, but uh, the rest of our time this morning, or I guess this afternoon, we'll be talking about the changes to the policy. Uh, one of the things we want to highlight is that for the second straight year, the fraternity will see a decrease in its per man average rate for uh, insurance this year. So that's an 8% decrease this year uh, versus last year. And that's on top of uh, last year seeing a 9% decrease as well. So the fraternities worked extremely hard to find ways to address that rising cost of insurance and membership. Uh, last year, we were able to provide that 9% decrease as a uh, result of using loss prevention reserves. Um, this year, that 8% decrease is a direct result of the fraternity changing its insurance carriers. Uh, as I noted, we have been acutely aware of the concern about rising costs of membership, uh, primarily around insurance. And so we have worked really hard to find alternatives of uh, insurance and other modes to be able to uh, provide that to our undergraduate chapters, our advisors, uh, et cetera. And so uh, after extensive uh, searching and research, we were able to uh, identify that we were able to change carriers for uh, the coming year. That change will take effect October 1. Uh, it will be in line with our normal renewal uh, period. So for those that have been advisors before, uh, you'll know that our uh, insurance policy changes October 1 of each year. And so that decision was made to, uh, to change. And in doing so, we've been able to pass along the immediate cost savings to, to the undergraduates. The change, as you see there, is going from FRMT, which was a um, insurance captive, essentially owned by uh, 25 uh, men's fraternities to be able to provide insurance to those uh, groups, to now a standalone policy with uh, Admiral Insurance. Um, the impact really is about moving to a uh, situation in which our losses are going, our, our expense is only going to be directly related to DU's losses. We won't be in a pool with uh, other fraternities and, and other fraternities' losses. Essentially, our limits and coverage remain the same as they have been over the past several years. And so those limits are a $1 million per occurrence limit, um, and a $2 million aggregate uh, per occurrence. So that 1 million, 2 million coverage that we've provided before will remain uh, the same moving forward. Um, the change primarily for chapters is that uh, for the last five years, we've had sublimits at $250,000 for the chapters, and that has been removed. So chapters moving forward will be insured at that same 1 million, 2 million uh, limit. And so that's a, a benefit to the undergraduate chapters. Our general liability policy does apply for the undergraduate chapters, alumni chapters, house corporations, um, the advisory boards, advisors, uh, educational foundations, if there is a local foundation, and all of those entities do receive uh, the full limits uh, as it relates to that insurance policy. Um, one of the biggest benefits that uh, we've been able to provide through the insurance, especially as it relates to our relationship with host institutions, universities, and colleges, is that we're able to continue to provide additional insured status on our policy when requested. Um, again, a lot of times that comes through a relationship statement or uh, an expectation by university or college, and so we're able to continue to provide that. Uh, on other instances, there may be the need to name an event location or a vendor as an additional insured and depending upon those um, requests, we can most of the time uh, approve those. And you can send me any additional insured requests in the future and we can process those accordingly. Uh, and then in addition, specific to our Canadian brothers, um, 
there have been questions about uh, having a policy admitted in Canada and in line with Canadian law. In this change to Admiral, they have a sister company, Berkeley Canada, that allows us to have an admitted policy there in uh, Canada. And so that's a benefit um, uh, for the organization as well. You'll see that um, also in that memo we sent on August 25th, we did address uh, a change within the directors and officers coverage. While the coverage didn't change, uh, we did see a 25% increase in the premium charge to the fraternity. And so unfortunately we had to increase that DNO charge to chapters from $550 to $700. Um, there continues to be the option or ability for chapters to decline that coverage if they um, uh, don't feel that uh, it is applicable to them. Uh, I will share that the DNO is applicable to any and all chapters, um, but it is probably most beneficial to chapters with housing or to chapters that have uh, employees, whether it be through the chapter, or through the house corporation, and that it really protects against uh, the business interests and the fiduciary responsibility of uh, the alumni group and the undergraduates. There are some alumni chapters or house corporations that pay that for the undergraduate chapter. Um, it's relatively common to see that. And there are also, of course, uh, chapters that pay that directly. Probably the big thing to note overall with our insurance program is that in the past, while we have been a part of a captive insurance company and uh, our losses may have been or are commingled or were commingled with the losses of other fraternities um, there was the ability to uh, write out potentially some um, larger losses within du now that we're in a standalone policy we uh, will rest solely on our own loss uh, history and so that means our behavior is of the utmost importance more now than ever and that we really need to rely on the undergraduates to exhibit good behavior, to be good men of merit, uh, and to exhibit good character throughout uh, the school year in that any loss or impact on the insurance uh, in the course of the next year will be a direct impact on what uh, the fraternity will be charged for its general liability insurance in the coming years. So with that, uh, we will move to questions, whether it's about the insurance program or anything that we've presented today about the loss prevention policy, the best practices, substance-free housing. Feel free to use the question and answer box. Uh, if you have a specific question related to your chapter or associate chapter, um, it may be best to address those offline. You can contact any of the three of us or your chapter liaison to address those, uh, but feel free to uh, ask your questions now in the Q&A box. I, ooh, ooh, sorry. All right. Um, here's our contact information. So if you do need to get hold of us specifically, um, also, if you're not aware who your chapter's liaison is, um, please let us know as well. We can um, put you in touch with that person. Um, but here are, like I said, um, if you will give it a, another minute or so, if you have any questions, but feel free to reach out for um, basically, whoever spoke about that section today would be probably the best person to follow up with on a particular area. Um, all of us could answer those questions, but if you have questions about insurance, substance-free housing, judicial procedures, any of us can answer questions about the policy, but just let us know what, what we can do to help. All right. Well, okay. seeing none, it sounds <laughs> yeah. like everybody started their weekend, so... Uh, Dominic, go ahead and close this out. Oh, wait, did we get a question? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, yes. Uh, we'll put the link to the alumni registration process. Um, yes. And actually, you know, Kathy, I can email you directly with that. Um, but let me, but if, unless someone has it handy. So, oh, perfect. Great. Someone could do that. Perfect. Great. We appreciate you being here. Um, please let us know if you have any questions. If not, have a great weekend. And we will see you all soon. <laughs>